All right, so welcome to the fourth lecture in my lecture series to supplement my book, Based Deleuze. We have now covered a lot of concepts so far. Uh, it probably makes sense actually for me to give you a very brief review, a little bit of a recap. We'll kind of go rapid fire over all of the previous sessions. So lecture one was about the Deleuzean concept of transcendental empiricism. I explained what he meant by that unpacked it a bit, compared it to Kant's transcendental idealism, and unpacked some of the implications, all right? Then we talked about the concept of imminence, which is a really important concept in the Deleuzean worldview. We, again, just essentially explained what he meant by imminence, how it was different than a kind of conventional concept of imminence, and why it matters, really. All of these lectures have been pretty short and sweet, focused on drawing out the concrete implications of these various abstract ideas, trying to make this kind of difficult abstract philosophy that Deleuze is known for, trying to make it concrete and and more immediately digestible. Yesterday, in yesterday's lecture, we talked about the concept of univocity, galaxy brain meme, Dun Scotus, and we talked about uh, a bunch of other things also. And so, yeah, now we are uh, prepared to talk about Deleuze's vision for what radical politics might look like in contemporary information societies. And in particular, we are going to focus on his late essay, uh, The Postscript, short for Postscript on the Societies of Control. It's a very interesting essay. It's quite unique, in fact, in his body of work. And I'll talk about why in just a moment. And we're going to try to tease out from this essay what Deleuze really envisioned for a positive kind of radical politics. He doesn't actually talk too much about what a Deleuzean praxis would really entail, but he does leave some hints, and I am going to make my own argument about what I think that Deleuzean practice, uh, praxis would entail or what that would look like. And to do that, I'm going to have to draw on some other, perhaps somewhat unexpected resources, but that will, that is what I'm going to do today. All right, so... In particular, here's a little bit of an overview or a roadmap. We are going to start with the discussion of Deleuze's postscript. I'm going to break down the major arguments in that essay and try to just leave you with a refresher or a summary, a kind of schematization of the major lines of logic in the postscript. That'll be the first goal. And then once we do that, I am going to make some arguments about what I think is really the underlying background context for what he's saying in that essay. Namely, it's the information revolution, which is a fairly specific and discrete event that occurred around the middle of the 20th century. And today, with all of our digital technology, we are essentially living through the wake of the information revolution. And obviously, many of you are already aware that when we talk about information societies, or the information age, and you know, we think about the internet and social media and all of this, it's sort of obvious on one level that we are in this kind of information age. But I don't think a lot of people understand the basic concrete history behind it, that this was something that kicked off at a relatively discrete moment in time with particular players and particular ideas. So I'm just going to try to spell that out a little bit, because I think it's a kind of crucial bit of background context for what's really going on in Deleuze's postscript. And I also think it's crucial for really understanding what Deleuze is trying to say. As always, Deleuze's essays are very enigmatic and inspiring and and colorful and stimulating for sure. He's he's very good at developing ideas in that way. But it's often quite dense. It's it, even if you're, you know, very well read and you pay a lot of attention to his works very closely and patiently, it's still just it's it's hard to really walk away from his writings with a particularly concrete or useful kind of grasp of what exactly was going on in in, in what he was writing. So I think uh, a discussion of a little bit of a discussion about the nature of information and what the information revolution was will I think make it more concrete. So that will be the purpose of a bit of a exploration of of the information revolution and its and its aftermath. And then finally, I'm going to make a more positive case, and this will be me uh, getting somewhat creative here. This is departing somewhat from the literal 
you know, words that, that Deleuze uses, um, I am going to make a case that a Deleuzean radical politics is essentially, it essentially converges with ancient cynicism or what uh, Peter Sloterdijk spells with a K for good reason, and I'll, and I'll go into that later. But the basic logic of ancient cynicism, as embodied by someone like Diogenes of Sinope, the basic logic was this idea of defacing the currency. And as we're going to see, this actually has some explicit resonance with the arguments put forward in the postscript. Deleuze talks about currency, for instance. He talks about exchange rates even. And so this concept of defacing the currency, which was associated with Diogenes of Sinope, the famous uh, ancient cynic, will be kind of my jumping off point for making a more elaborate argument about what a real Deleuzean radical politics or praxis might look like. I think it. I think it's going to look something quite like what Diogenes of Sinope was engaged in, but for a kind of digital culture. That's essentially going to be the argument that I will make in the end. So there you have it. That's an overview or a roadmap of where we're going with all this. The story starts with this guy, Michel Foucault. He is sort of the obvious towering background persona in Deleuze's postscript. The concept of societies of control, which Deleuze introduces in this essay, is a reference to what Foucault called disciplinary societies. In Foucault's writings, he talks about disciplinary societies with a few different terms. You might remember it differently depending on which of his books had the most impression, you know, the strongest impression on you. He sometimes called them uh, societies of enclosure or um, disciplinary societies. I think there were perhaps a few other terms that he used to describe the social formations that he was really interested in, in particular in the 18th and 19th century. So very briefly, I'm just going to give you a quick and dirty kind of cartoonish summary of what, what Foucault described when he referred to disciplinary institutions or societies of enclosure or whatever particular phrase he might have used. Essentially, he was describing the major large institutions that define kind of modern society as we knew it before the rise of digital technology. So his major case studies were always the school, the prison, and the hospital. Th those were those were kind of the essential examples of what he called, you know, disciplinary institutions or the institutions that represented what he called disciplinary society. Okay, and he contrasted disciplinary societies to uh, the age of of sovereignty or or sovereign societies uh, or the sovereign period, and that was essentially you know think of traditional monarchs and. You know they were mostly con they were mostly concerned with uh, administering death, for instance, for you know high crimes and treason and attacks on the legitimacy of the crown. But they were never really that interested in production per se, or you know maximizing the the capacities of their you know biopolitical mass. It was essentially just a kind of si relatively simple top down structure with the monarch at the top, and it was all about the sovereignty of the monarch, right? So that was the the, the period of sovereignty, or that's what that's what Foucault has in mind when he talks about the the sovereign societies. It was relatively simple. It was mostly about taxation, essentially, is what the king or queen was mostly interested in. And this gives way in the 19th and 18th century to what he calls disciplinary societies with the rise of these large institutions such as the school, the prison, and the hospital. So he has separate books on all of these. Uh, perhaps his most famous book is Discipline and Punish, which some of you might have read, which is essentially about kind of the history of uh, discipline and in particular incarceration. So there are lengthy studies or lengthy chapters in that book about kind of the rise of the modern prison as it distinguished itself from the pre-modern prison. And of course, this is where he talks about his famous panopticon concept. So the modern prison is this kind of unified large structure that takes in individuals and pays close attention to their bodies, disciplines, individuals' bodies, essentially. Every prisoner who comes into the modern prison uh, 
kind of comes in on a sort of assembly line of discipline. The panopticon is this kind of clever architectural structure that's circular where there's a watchtower in the middle and then all of the individual cells are lined up around the watchtower in the middle. And one of Foucault's interesting arguments about the panopticon is that there doesn't need to even be anyone in that watchtower. The mere fact that the individuals in their cells know that they could be watched is enough for the for the panopticon to have its effect. He also studies, you know, the the history of medicine. He has he has separate works on on the rise of of modern hospitals, and and he also talks about schools. So those are kind of the three major representatives or institutions that represent what Deleuze called uh, disciplinary societies. And just to reiterate, this is essentially in the 18th and 19th century is what is what Deleuze is. I'm sorry, what Foucault is kind of most interested in when he's talking about these. Uh, disciplinary institutions or the society of 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 the the disciplinary society the disciplinary society is essentially has its its heyday in the 18th and 19th centuries okay so that's the major foil against which Deleuze is writing his postscript he's essentially the major argument of the postscript is that Foucault's diagnoses of disciplinary society are no longer valid that they are being replaced they are giving way to what Deleuze calls control societies, okay? So let's unpack more specifically what Deleuze is saying about this contrast. If you look at the postscript, which by the way is a fairly short essay, and for Foucault, I'm sorry, for Deleuze, it's relatively quite schematic, much more so than his than a lot of his other works. It's actually quite precise, and he draws a bunch of direct parallels or contrasts. So I want to take a moment in the next slide to unpack what those are. And I've actually listed some out for you. Okay. So throughout the postscript, Deleuze makes these contrasts where he points out what a particular item would have been in the Foucauldian model and what a particular item is now in the Deleuzean model. So Disciplinary societies were characterized by independent variables. And I'm just going to kind of briefly go through these. I won't belabor them or be too uh, tedious about it. But basically, he says that disciplinary societies were independent variables, whereas control societies were inseparable variations. And what he means by this is that the prison was a relatively isolated, specific institution that served as a particular task of, of, of dealing with uh, deviants and disciplining deviant bodies, right? Criminals. But the relationship between the prison and the school and the hospital was not at all developed. The, these were relatively discrete institutions, which had particular purposes. I think that's what he means by independent variables. They had their own effects. They sought to have their own consequences and produce their own effects, but in relatively independent, discrete ways. Whereas in control societies, the dominant institutions, including the school, the prison, the hospital, these all of these institutions are now much more densely connected through data, through networked processes. This is what he means by inseparable variations. He said, Deleuze says that the disciplinary societies were based on discontinuous institutions. Again, that's very similar, but I'm just I'm, I'm essentially just giving you the words that he that Deleuze uses. Whereas the control societies are more continuous. So. This has a more kind of temporal connotation. In other words, if you go to prison, when you get out of the prison, you might need to go to the hospital later. But between that exiting of the prison and entering of the hospital, there is a time period that is relatively untouched in which you are relatively free, one might even say. Whereas in control societies, there's much less of a gap. When you exit the school, before, you know, uh, once you exit the school and you get ready to go into your profession or something, let's say there's much less of a gap there. It's almost like entry into a second stage institution is already beginning at the end of a kind of initial stage institution. That's what he means by discontinuous versus continuous. He says that disciplinary societies, their institutions were essentially molds, whereas in control societies, it's modulations. So again, he's really kind of just drawing out a, a, a similar overlapping theme here. These are kind of variations on a theme. He talks about how in disciplinary societies, there were 
relatively discrete acquittals or exits of particular institutional stages. I kind of said that before when I talked about the, the difference between the prison and the, you know, entering the hospital later or something like this. You know, when you're done with the hospital, right, when you're cured or whatever, when you're when your process at the hospital is over, you get discharged in the in the traditional period, in the in the period of disciplinary societies. You're done, right? You're out of there. So it's you're relatively acquitted. Same thing with with prison. Nowadays, what do they have? You might be on parole or you might be on probation. And then even your probation has a probation because you have to wear some ankle bracelet that monitors where you are. Right. So we're Deleuze is alerting us to these processes in which the borders between institutions are increasingly blurry and on a temporal level, they increasingly bleed into one another. So, you know, the form the prison in the 18th century might have been a quite a brutal place, but at least when you were out, you were out. Now, you know, you, when you get out, you are still kind of in, right? So that's that's what he's that's what he's saying there. And he talks about how in the in the typical modern disciplinary institution, there the the kind of hallmark of that institution was individual signatures and their numbers. So, I think what he means by that is when a prisoner enters you know, the, it, you know, the 19th century prison that Foucault describes at length, that, that prisoner is entered into a system where that individual's body is associated with a particular number. And then it's kind of the monitoring and the control of that individual body and its number. Whereas what he says is that in, in uh, control societies, it's no longer about individual bodies. And I think this is one of the more interesting and useful distinctions that Deleuze is making in the in this in this essay it control societies are not actually interested in individual bodies they're interested in abstract variables essentially and any individual body is only a, a kind of representative of a kind of probability distribution and that's I think really crucial and 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 not obvious so so that's going to be something that I I spend some time on there are also some other kind of funnier um, distinctions. He talks about how uh, disciplinary institutions were, or disciplinary societies, I should say, were about sports, whereas control societies are more about surfing. Everything is surfing now. I thought that was kind of funny. Um, obviously, there's a reference there to kind of uh, surfing the web in some sense. The essay, by the way, the the postscript was written in the early 90s, right? So Deleuze might have had an inkling of what was coming with the internet, but hardly any kind of data on what uh, a, an internet society would really look like. Okay. So in, in some, in some interesting ways, it's quite prophetic, right? I think the mention of surfing is, you know, kind of interesting for that reason. Web surfing is the obvious kind of reference I'm making there. He talks about how the disciplinary societies had their mole. Um, and here he's referring to money and in particular kind of traditional gold backed money. It's only a passing reference. I don't, I wouldn't make too much of it. Frankly, I don't think Deleuze's economics are extremely sophisticated. I'm not saying he's wrong or dumb, but I wouldn't, you know, spend too much time investing in, in his kind of economic references, although they are suggestive. And as we see, I'm going to talk about the exchange rates in particular. I think, I think there's something really there. Um, but he talks about the mole of money in disciplinary societies. It was this kind of underground, latent, hidden, kind of anchoring for all of the disciplinary societies is something that he essentially suggests in his essay that the prison, the school, the hospital were all kind of um, in a latent way kind of undergirded and, and subordinated to a kind of fixed gold standard. I'm not, I'm not sure that argument is, is, is particularly clear, to be honest, but a little bit more interesting is that what he says is in contrast to the mole of money in disciplinary societies, in control societies, the the mole has given way to the serpent and again he's painting for us a kind of aesthetics of flexibility of continuous variation of a kind of cybernetic systemic self-regulation of the social system as opposed to the rigid blunt centralized discrete institutions of the disciplinary society so the serpent and its its coils the serpent and its, you know, slithering nature, 
is a kind of aesthetic representation of control societies, whereas it's it's the mole and the 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 kind of burrowing, hidden nature of of kind of gold backed money that was the kind of aesthetic symbol of disciplinary societies. As as I'll talk about in, in just a moment, there is something there I think with the exchange rates that is legit and empirical, and quite sophisticated and useful. Now, here's something that I think is really important about these contrasts. He does make reference to the corresponding dangers or vulnerabilities of these two different epochs. In the epoch of the disciplinary society, the danger was entropy and sabotage. So what does he mean by that? Well, if you're trying to or run and organize a prison in the 19th century, as Foucault describes it, in fact, one of his case studies is from Philadelphia, and uh, I visited that prison. It's pretty interesting, but that's just a bit of a tangent. The, the 19th century or 18th century prison, the way that it fails or the way that it goes wrong is perhaps you have prison breaks. Perhaps there are mass prison uprisings, and you know the all of the prisoners kind of overthrow the guards and escape all at once or something like this. That kind of stuff actually happened occasionally back in the day. Nowadays, security is so good that that's not really a risk anymore, right? There were still uprisings and riots, but almost never do all of the prisoners like get out or a substantial number of them get out. Or entropy, right? And that's just kind of the breakdown of the controlled system. Or it's very hard to run organized, top-down, centralized uh, disciplinary systems such as a prison in, in the 18th century or 19th century. Okay, so just – manage basic management problems people not obeying rules managers not obeying rules the wardens not obeying rules just that general everyday problem of the management structures not working and breaking down is what he means by entropy so those things were constantly problems and risks for the representatives of disciplinary institutions in the epoch of the disciplinary society and what he says what Deleuze says is that in control societies today, those are no longer the dangers because uh, the machines that define our society today are not based on this kind of chan this centralized channeling of energy in particular ways that are fragile and sensitive to break down. What he says is that nowadays, the social machines that are most important are based on computing. And when things are based on computing, Entropy and sabotage are not that much of a problem anymore, right? Of course, there are still basic problems of entropy and, and there are basic problems of sabotage. But for instance, if you're a tech entrepreneur or something like this, maybe you're you know, running some kind of uh, sophisticated web application that is performing you know, some sort of function. Sure, there's entropy and sabotage that can happen, but for the most part with modern computing technology – if you know what you're doing and you have the proper testing methods and you have proper security protocols, as long as you're doing it right, you can pretty much rest assured that that system is going to operate identically one day after another in a highly reproducible and robust way. That, in other words, more or less solves the certain problems of, of entropy and solves certain problems of sabotage. But what he says is that new types of vulnerabilities open up in the institutions that define control societies. And the new problems are jamming, piracy, and viruses, he mentions explicitly. And the reason I think this is important to flag is because the postscript is pretty short on suggestions. It's pretty short on advice or positive prescriptions of any kind. It's almost completely diagnostic rather than prescriptive. It's trying to explain where where society is going and where it's at now, in particular, um, how it departs from the Foucauldian diagnoses. He does not say that much about what we should do moving forward. And I think that the, this is where he gives us one of the most precise hints in, in the text. By pointing out where he thinks the institutions of control societies are vulnerable or what their dangers or risks are, he's implicitly giving us a hint as to where we might find a point of application for a new type of praxis, if you will. Okay, so I'm going to seize on this uh, in a moment. I'm going to circle back to this, to this danger that Deleuze sees in control societies, their vulnerabilities, 
in jamming piracy and viruses because I think that that is one of the most promising places to think about where we can create new forms of liberating uh, politics, essentially. All right, so a few last points. Briefly, uh, Deleuze talks about how disciplinary societies were primarily about production, right? So the factory, for instance, I haven't talked as much about the factory, but along with the school, the prison, the hospital, another kind of classic disciplinary institution characteristic of the Foucauldian disciplinary society is the factory. Uh, so think about the, you know, the traditional assembly line, this kind of, um, you know, mass production process where you have these workers where every worker is working on like one part of a car or something like that, right? Over and over again, those people need to be controlled and disciplined in a fairly strict and centralized way. And all of that was about production. It was about maximizing production. But what, he, what Deleuze says is that in control societies, the economic firms are no longer, they no longer have that kind of controlling centralized apparatus that is all about maximizing production. Rather, the, the real locus of economic energy in control societies is essentially at the level of marketing. Okay, so to give you an example of this, which Deleuze doesn't mention, but people might not know exactly what this means. To give you an example, if you think about the big brands of today, think about Nike or Apple, for instance, you realize that Nike and Apple don't make things. You get that, right? It, it, if you don't understand this, it, it, you should really pause on it because it's it's a kind of a profound point if, if you don't already know this. Nike or Apple, they're owners of a symbol, right? The Apple symbol, the Apple intellectual property or the Nike swoosh logo, right? And the, the Nike intellectual property. They own that brand. But the actual production of sneakers or computers, that's contracted out. That's outsourced out. So on a very technical level, Apple does not make its computers. Nike does not make its shoes. The power of Nike or Apple and the reason that they are so huge and make extraordinary amounts of money is because they were kind of the, you know, the 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 people who initially kind of created an essentially information structure. It was essentially an information structure, right? If you launch a brand or a logo or just a, a company, right? A kind of claim to intellectual property, then whatever you make and all the kind of networks of production that you're able to, to compose underneath that brand, um, you know, you're going to benefit from, you're going to profit from obviously, but the real added value, the real unique thing that Apple or Nike owns and contributes to their massive networked apparatus is essentially just the, the, the symbol, the brand and, and that, and the ownership, the, all the trademarks and, uh, ownership that, that flow from that essential kind of brand ownership. Okay. So that's, that's actually, it is a, it is a very profound thing. It is a very profound difference. And that's essentially what Deleuze is talking about. So now in Western societies, all of the decent jobs really come through some form of adding value through a kind of manip manipulation of information. And that manipulation of information usually has something to do with marketing or and marketing understood in, in, in its broadest sense of um, creating images, creating text or symbols that in one way or another have some effect on getting someone to buy something somewhere, right? And that's a very diffuse network. That's a very diffuse uh, set of processes. So that's what that's what he means by marketing, okay? It's not just what you might have in your mind when you think of marketing, okay? And then finally, the control societies, the processes that Deleuze is talking about, these control processes, they, almost all of them are much more short-term. They're much more flexible, fluid, with rapid turnover, right? So, and, and whereas in the disciplinary societies that, uh, Foucault described, you know, everything took a really long time, right? Think about like building a prison, a massive prison in the 18th century in using these like new, totally new philosophies of how to institute kind of penal structures. This was extremely difficult, especially when you're doing it without things like computers, right? Um, the, it required extraordinary uh, sums of money and people and resources and time. Right, things have just moved way slower. Whereas nowadays, look at like the gig economy, for instance. Look at jobs. Um, you know, the factory worker in the disciplinary society might have had a pretty difficult and oppressed life 
but one worker at one factory might be there for a very long time, right? Whereas now, if you're an information worker in a kind of modern Western digital society, you know, you're very likely to have many jobs over the course of a life. Um, you're constantly moving from one thing to the next and businesses are constantly arising and then going away. Startups are, you know, shooting to a billion dollars uh, annually, like in rapid fire, and then they, they die and go away with the same rapidity sometimes, right? So um, although things might seem sometimes more kind of humane, right, like the the, the lean, agile tech startup culture, the management philosophies that are dominant today, they're not about, you know, sucking the last dollar out of every worker or standardizing, uh, you know, industrial assembly lines like they used to be. You know, the 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 tech founder of today wants the the startup workplace culture to be humane and supportive. And, uh, you know, the, these sorts of these sorts of norms are now much more common. And it's much more about symbol creation, uh, what what Deleuze calls marketing. Uh, but what's something we also see is that everything lasts a little bit, you know, things don't last as long, right? There, there's everything shorter term and more rapidly turning over. Okay. So that is all just a breakdown and unpacking of the specific contrasts that Deleuze is drawing where contemporary digital societies depart from disciplinary societies as described by Foucault. And for what it's worth, folks, you might already know this, but, you know, Foucault is at the time kind of the towering figure of French philosophy, okay? Deleuze is uh, a little bit younger, I believe, or in any event, he, his work uh, comes a bit after. So, so Foucault is kind of more dominant and more influential uh, before Deleuze really becomes well-known, I think it's fair to say. And so this is why the entire essay is kind of written against or in contrast to the Foucauldian understanding of disciplinary societies because this is the framework that so many people who follow you know, kind of French philosophy at the time would have had in their minds. So it's it's a pretty major moment. It's a pretty significant step for Deleuze to write this kind of political social essay that's diagnostic of of the civilization in some sense, uh, in contrast to to the Foucauldian philosophy. He's really distinguishing himself from uh, the master at the time in this way. Okay, so that's just a, a very schematic breakdown. And as I said, it's actually quite rare for Deleuze's text to be this schematic. Uh, he's, he's actually quite precise in drawing out these different differences. That's why it was relatively straightforward to throw them up on a screen here. Okay, so now what we need to do is, or what I would like to do, is spell out for you in a little bit more detail what is the larger significance of this? Like, why is this interesting? What is he really talking about? Instead of looking at this list of contrasts, what is the more general point of interest here? What's a more kind of concrete and and specific kind of takeaway or theoretical condensation of this. And what I would argue is that all Deleuze is really talking about is the rise of the information age, essentially. And the information age has a relatively discrete and specific kind of temporal localization. It, it, the, all of the digital technology that we're seeing today and the kind of explosion of technological innovation that we're living through pretty much got its start in the war effort of the US and the UK. So think of people like Claude Shannon and people like Alan Turing. I mentioned this briefly in my lecture yesterday. The information age as we know it pretty much became possible because of an extraordinary amount of research and development that was conducted by the Western countries to defeat um, uh, you know, the, the, their opponents in World War II. Okay, so uh, that's the that's kind of the, one of the larger arguments I want to kind of put on the map for you. And I think it's just a nice way to kind of summarize or condense what's going on here and why it's interesting. So in other words, what all of these kind of specific differences that Deleuze is describing, what it essentially boils down to is that there is, at the time he's writing and certainly today still, there is an explosion of data, right? That's one of the major kind of hallmarks of, of the information explosion that happens after World War II. Okay, so we just have much more data. Capacities for measurement are much cheaper and more reliable in pretty much every domain. And the cost of different institutions communicating with other institutions is rapidly decreasing. So when you take all of those things together as kind of ongoing trends following in the wake of the information revolution, 
you get these distinctions that that Deleuze is identifying between the old societies and the new societies. Okay, so I think that this is useful because it kind of condenses all of these different bullet points into a kind of more specific and discrete kind of theoretical summary that is a little bit more tractable. What's really going on here, in other words, is the explosion of data, the decreasing cost of data, uh, the increasing efficiency of, of computing power, and the increasing ease and efficiency for various types of institutions, including individuals, by the way, to measure things and to share those measurements. Okay. So that's essentially what's going on here. When that happens, you get all of these differences. And something that I want to kind of drive home for people, which I don't think is very obvious to most people, is that at least I would argue there is a relatively discrete and specific kind of moment where these converging trends all get kind of kicked up. And I would argue, I alluded to this in the lecture yesterday, I would argue that it is essentially the discovery of the true nature of information as such. It is the discovery of the mathematical theory of information. Up until the war effort, we did not know exactly what information was, essentially. It was a set of pretty specific discoveries in which we finally learned the raw nature of what information even means. And I think that is why you see from there the kind of accelerating uh, escalation of technological innovation. Okay, so I just want to spend a moment uh, unpacking that briefly for people who maybe have no idea what I'm talking about. So this is a famous diagram that comes out of a famous paper by someone named Claude Shannon, who is a kind of a genius polymath figure who worked for or with or alongside to some degree Bell Labs. And Bell Labs in the American 20th century was pretty much this sort of unprecedented investment in basic scientific and mathematic research and development. So in a, a ridiculous number of technological innovations and theoretic discoveries came out of this of the of Bell Labs and Bell Labs really found its impetus and, and major motivation and a lot of its funding because there was a major interest in doing things like decrypting the the Nazi codes or what have you. Okay, so a lot was at stake. In other words, national security was at stake and there was a felt sense of urgency that from American policymakers and American businessmen, there was just a kind of uh, spirit in the air that said, we have to invest tons of money into basically paying all the smartest people we can find to essentially do whatever they want, whatever they think is most important. And that's essentially what happened. That's essentially what Bell Labs in its heyday represented. And you had similar examples in the UK also, but really I think Bell Labs in the United States was kind of the epicenter of what I'm talking about here. And so during those years in the middle of the 20th century, a ridiculous amount of discoveries were made and innovations were had. So, you know, for instance, everything ranging from the the theory of, of communication, the theory of information, which I'll talk about in just a moment with this diagram, but also things like the transistor, right? Uh, innovations in materials and, and, and things like that were, were discovered because you basically put a whole bunch of geniuses in one room and you gave them a lot of free time and money to essentially do whatever they want. And you told them, oh yeah, if you fail, uh, we might get destroyed by the Nazis. So that's that's kind of what's going on in the middle of the 20th century. And I would argue that what happened is this was so successful, discoveries were made such as the nature of information itself was formalized for the first time ever in uh, arguably this this paper in particular, but obviously other kind of corresponding discoveries and extensions of it. And I would argue that it was from this moment that Everything we're seeing today, like the internet and all of the trends that we are observing with what appears to be a kind of uh, accelerating or escalating uh, series of technological innovations, think of things like Moore's law, right, or the kind of exponential increase in computing power. There's some arguments that this might be uh, tapering off, but in any event, the all of the kind of converging trends we're seeing, right, like how radio and television and uh, newspapers are kind of converging into this one thing, which is digital media, right? How the phone, right? Our phones are now 
the same thing as our computers and our video screens and our radios, right? There's this kind of convergence of all of the traditional electronic media are now converging strangely into this one media, which is essentially the internet. And I could, I could write, I could, you know, uh, cite a whole bunch of other trends or phenomena, but all I'm really trying to say is that this new world we're in characterized by digital technology is all of the various kind of aspects of it essentially have a shared root, which is the discovery of the nature of information, which allows for uh, a profound uh, quantity of innovations to emerge in different ways. Okay, so I'm not going to give you a big elaborate story about uh, how exactly that works or what exactly I mean by that, but I think uh, you know what I'm talking about. Maybe it's something I can spell out at a later date, or we could we could conduct uh, some more sophisticated studies on it at a later date. In fact, I, I teach a course on the politics of media where I do actually go on about this at, at some length, and I do kind of break it down a bit. So I taught that at university, so I'll see about maybe um, building that up and, and maybe making it available somehow in any event. What we're looking at here in this diagram is a, a, a schematic of one of Claude Shannon's essential kind of insights into what the nature of communication is. And all this is really saying, by the way, it's a very complicated paper, but this diagram is, is relatively straightforward, that information involves the transmission of a signal from one entity to another through a channel of noise. Okay, so this difference between signal and noise, that's something you might have heard before. This is this is um, where that comes from, essentially, or this is the kind of formalization of of that. And so this is general communication system. This is the basic raw formulation or formalization of what communication requires or involves. It requires you to uh, get a piece of information from one source to a destination through a kind of enemy line, right? A kind of uh, blocking or obstacle, which is called noise. And there's no way around this. Every bit of communication, every instance of communication has to traverse noise to some degree. Okay. I won't belabor this, uh, because it's not the main focus, but it will kind of matter. I, I, I will kind of circle back to this because when we talk about kinesism and what I would argue is a kind of Deleuzean radical politics fit for the information age, I'm going to talk about signals. I'm going to talk about the function of speaking and acting in unexpected ways. And what I'm going to be really talking about there is the, a difference between signal and noise. So to foreshadow just briefly, one of the problems we have today is that we're all free to speak, right? We have free speech. And in general, in Western societies, you, most people are pretty free to say whatever they want, you, you know, uh, notwithstanding the problems of, you know, cancellation and all of that, for the most part, at least in the historical scheme of things. People can speak pretty much whatever they want. But there is this problem where it's almost as if we are so free to speak whatever we want in modern Western societies that it has a way of neutralizing itself. So you can make a whole bunch of really good arguments, right, about why you know, Congress people in Washington, D.C. are totally corrupt and should not be trusted or something like that. But it doesn't have any effect, right? It doesn't go anywhere. There, There is this kind of system we have in place where power operates on one level and our speech operates on a totally different level. And no matter how smart or effective or moving our rational speech is, no matter how hard you try to really be honest and accurate and develop a kind of rational message to put out into the world. There's this weird problem today where it's almost, it feels like as if all rational dialogue is like neutralized in advance. Okay. So that's going to be the motivation that that's why I'm talking about this formal distinction between signal and noise and this kind of mathematical theory of communication, the reason I'm bringing this up is because I just want to give you a touchstone for when I talk about this problem of political speech in 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 the subsequent slides, okay? And also, the other reason I'm bringing this up is because this is ultimately what's at the source, I would say, of, De, of Deleuze's diagnoses of the control societies. This is why the control societies or digital societies, information societies, as we live in them now today, the reason that they're so different point by point 
from the Foucault and disciplinary societies is because we figured out on a formal level what information is, what communication is. And once we formalize that, it suddenly allowed us to do things like essentially merge all of the different electronic media into this one uh, kind of wide open, massive digital space, for instance. Okay. So, all right. I think that is enough on, on this point. I don't want to belabor it. And we are now going to move back in time. We're going to move back in history. As they say, the past is a foreign country. And what we were looking at here in this slide, let me center it, is we are looking at Diogenes of Sinope. All right. This is a painting that shows Diogenes in a barrel. And he is reaching his hand out to Alexander the Great. Okay. So I'm going to use this as a jumping off point to essentially introduce you to the ancient philosophy of cynicism or what Peter Sloterdijk calls kinicism. The reason for that, by the way, is that cynicism means something very different in most people's minds today, but I'll explain that in just a minute. Diogenes of Sinope was a philosopher. I would personally argue probably the greatest philosopher to have ever lived. A lot of people would disagree with that, but what was Diogenes' philosophy? Well, it was very strange. It's not what most people have in mind when they think of philosophy. He was essentially a kind of performance artist. He didn't really write much, if anything at all. He lived like a crazy homeless man. He was known for living out of a barrel, which you see depicted here. And he would go around essentially pissing people off, performing what today we would think of as kind of publicity stunts. But he saw them as conducting philosophy. Let me give you some examples. He was known for such interesting feats as he was once uh, invited to give a talk or perform or just, you know, be present at one of the local sports competitions, the Isthmian Games, which is kind of like a, a, a proto-Olympics in some sense. You know, the Greeks, they loved their, uh, you know, manly bodies and uh, Chad athletic prowess. And they liked, you know, wrestling and uh, all of that good Greco-Roman stuff. And so they had, you know, well-attended sports events. And at one of these Isthmian Games, uh, Diogenes shat all over the stage. I talked about this in a, in a talk I did a few weeks ago. That's just to give you one example of, of the type of character that we're dealing with here. Why did he do that? Well, let's think about some of the other examples of his interesting behavior. He was known for one of the stunts he would do is he would go around with a lamp and uh, look like he's looking for something, right? Uh, and people would ask, and people would ask him, Diogenes, what are you looking for? And he would say, I'm looking for a man, you know, kind of insulting pretty much everyone around him, in, implying that that nobody around him, uh, nobody he could find was a real man. These these sorts of publicity stunts is, is what he was known for. He didn't really write, but he did articulate through these performances a particular philosophy. And he he left behind enough sayings and enough performance artifacts, if you will, that it's not hard to reconstruct what his philosophy was. And it's been done many times. There are many good books about it. So I will very briefly give you my rend my rendition of the Diogenes philosophy or what is more generally called ancient cynicism. He's kind of the father of ancient cynicism. And essentially, the way to understand all of these kind of crazed performances that he was known for doing was that he was essentially trying to do philosophy in a vitalistic kind of way. He was trying to perform arguments rather than simply speak them. What he's doing is he's laying bare the hypocrisies that are hidden within bourgeois society. And, you know, in some sense, ancient Greece is kind of one of the first bourgeois societies. It's the beginning of what we now think of as kind of bourgeois culture in some sense, in a Western sense. And what bourgeois culture involves, it's a fairly technical definition, in fact. The nature of bourgeois civilization or, you know, modern Western societies essentially is that we create a split between the private and the public. 
right? So think of manners. Think of, you know, the author Norbert Elias who wrote, you know, long sociological studies about the rise of manners. What is what are manners? What does it mean to have good table manners? What does it mean to be a civilized person? Well, it essentially means to fake yourself, right? It means to pretend. It means to present yourself as something other than what you are, right? Because what are we in fact? We're animals, right? We're monkeys. We have this kind of uh, compulsion in modern society to insist that we are not monkeys. And that is essentially what is great about modern society and also what is problematic and ultimately kind of rotten about it. So you can say all day that, you know, modern manners are bullshit, right? We should embrace our animal nature and modern bourgeois culture is oppressive and it's it's wrong and bad and it doesn't do justice to who we really are. You can say all these things on a rational level and you can make arguments, right? But no one will care. No one will listen because these kind of bourgeois hypocrisies, this this bourgeois hypocrisy is in – it's it's foundational. It's foundational to the very game that we're playing. So if you develop a critical philosophy, right, if you develop a philosophical critique of – some injustice in society and you develop it in a rational way, right? You kind of write a bunch of words in a, in a well-formulated essay with good spelling and grammar, and then you submit that essay to, you know, the Royal Society or whatever it might be. Um, you can do that for certain topics as long as they're playing within the rules of the game. But if you want to really critique the rules of the game, if you want to critique something truly foundational – to society as such, then rational rational discourse is going to be neutralized in advance, I think is a kind of general principle that you can draw here. And I think this is one of the kind of genius observations of someone like Diogenes. He realized that he couldn't make his critique through rational formulations of doctrines because the very effort to formulate a rational doctrine and submit it to civilized society is already buying in to what he's trying to critique. And if he does that, it's just going to have no effect. It's going to be it's going to be neutered in advance. They're just going to dismiss it or because it's participating in that which it's trying to critique, it's going to suffer from a kind of immediate inescapable hypocrisy of its own, right? And so the in, the genius insight of Diogenes and ancient cynicism is that if you want to critique something foundational about the hypocrisy of modern or bourgeois societies, then what you need to do is you need to perform it. And there are specific protocols to a kind of Diogenes-styled, cynical, philosophical performance. And in fact, to bring this full circle to where we started with Foucault, one of Foucault's best books is the transcripts of one of his late lectures. The book is called uh, The Courage of Truth. And it's the transcripts from his last, I believe, the, the final lectures of his life where he focused on ancient cynicism. So it's, it's really quite interesting when you, when, you, when, you, when you think about these connections now. In any event, he – Diogenes, that is – he realized that if you go out of your way to be the base animal that – bourgeois society pretends we are not, a few interesting things happen. One is that people can't ignore you, okay, because the things you're doing are so obscene, right, like shitting on the stage at the Olympics or um, walking around flagrantly insulting civilized people in a variety of different ways. So there, there are so many other anecdotes you can find about Diogenes. When you do that, People are gripped emotionally. They can't ignore you. They can't dismiss you. So that's the first That's the first insight. But the second logic to this idea is that if you can do these performances and remain based and content and take care of yourself in all the other basic ways that you need to take care of yourself to live a, a decent human life, then what you're doing is you're disproving those bourgeois hypocrisies and compromises. You're essentially proving your own contention in a live way 
right? Because the pretension of bourgeois manners and you know modern civilization, the the whole pretension is that you must be like this, right? You must be man. You must have good manners. You must be civilized. And if you don't, then all will be all will go wrong, right? Um, the, that is the that is the hidden implicit pretension that this is the right way to be, and that if you do it, good things happen, and if you don't do it, bad things happen. That's implied in in this reign of kind of bourgeois hypocrisy that we still live in today. And so, what what <clears throat> someone like Diogenes realizes is that if you disagree, right? If you think that actually bourgeois manners are are rooted in lies and that this is actually a, a really stupid and harmful way to live. If you believe that, then you should be able to show it through your actions. You should be able to find a way to live that is different. And the problem with that is it's going to be hated, right? It's going to be so kind of orthogonal to what is seen as normal that you're going to be hated, right? You see it with Socrates also, who's known as a gadfly and who was essentially executed for it. It's the same thing in a different style. And so these are the, the basic components of a kind of, of, of ancient cynicism or, or kinicism to, to distinguish it between, you know, from what people have in mind now when they think about cynicism. And maybe now is as good a time as any to, to go into that distinction. So nowadays when people think about cynicism, when you use that word cynicism, what does it mean? Let's take a sip of water. It typically means you say one thing and you do another. So that the, the emblem of cynicism, as we think about that word today, as it's typically used, is you know someone like a, um, an office worker who doesn't like his job, who kind of thinks it's all bullshit, and thinks you know he's participating in some kind of stupid or vaguely harmful kind of process, but just goes along with it anyway and doesn't really care. Because what are you going to do? That's a kind of cynical attitude and is not really interested in any type of particularly kind of honest or creative uh, investment in making things better, but just kind of goes along with it and says one thing, but the, his beliefs and his actions are not aligned. They're hypocritical and he doesn't really care about it. That's what most people I think have in mind when they use the word cynicism today. Obviously, what I'm talking about with ancient cynicism is almost the exact opposite. It's almost literally opposite. Someone like Diogenes is so offended by the nature of normal society that he can't go along with it. He refuses to go along with it and in a kind of violent gesture makes his life and his beliefs and his actions all consistently aligned. And the cost of doing that is that people generally hate you you're constantly pissing people off. And also, for what it's worth, you you are always on the margins of society. Here you see him living out of a barrel, essentially like a crazy homeless man. So, But he would argue that this is the superior life and that he's living more wisely than anyone else. And he's happier and he's less troubled by unnecessary stupid concerns that you know normal bourgeois people are oppressed by. So Diogenes is essentially through a kind of the philosophy of ancient cynicism and its performative dimension, the the whole logic of ancient cynicism or kinical philosophy, it's it's a philosophy of the body or it's a, it's a dog-like philosophy. And uh, you are essentially proving your hypotheses in action through performance. And what's interesting about this particular painting is that it refers to another famous anecdote about Diogenes, which is that he was well-known and quite respected by people in power. So this is very interesting. To the average kind of merchant around him, he was probably just an annoying, crazy homeless man. So at the middle level of society, let's say, you know, the masses hated Diogenes. He's just an annoying loser, pretty much. It's how people would have seen him and how people would have described him. But the elites, especially the kind of the aristocrats of the spirit, the people who um, were themselves sophisticated and philosophical, you know, powerful people, truly powerful people, such as Alexander the Great, actually had a lot of respect for him. And so the famous the famous quote or kind of meme that comes out of this particular painting, for instance, or is associated with this painting, is that Alexander the Great famously said once that 
if he was not Alexander, he would like to be Diogenes. So that's very interesting, right? In other words, there is this weird phenomenon in society and the distribution of power in which it's really the middle, it's the bourgeois middle class that are kind of the stupid, powerless weaklings who are kind of just like following processes they don't fully understand that they're essentially being roped into either disciplinary institutions in the 18th and 19th century, according to Foucault, or they're being controlled by control societies and control institutions, the kind of cybernetic fluid control structures that Deleuze describes in his postscript. It's really the middle that they're just trying to be normal. They're just trying to be civilized. They're just trying to have good manners. They're just trying to do the right thing, which is essentially what is popular, what seems normal. It's that middle that's the weak, stupid kind of dupes of society and true power in society, political power, by the way, is had in this kind of bimodal structure, right? You can either be Alexander the Great, um, a great warrior, a great strategist, uh, an extremely strong will, and you can exercise political power and achieve political power through essentially uh, militaristic means. Or if you're not going to do that, if you're not that type of person, there is this other weird path to political power. That's what's going on here in this in this painting. And, and that is what Diogenes understood, I think, perhaps better than anyone else ever. He understood that there is a kind of opposite route to exercising political power. And it's not by trying to dominate, but it's by essentially pursuing a Deleuzian route. And this is where I've been going with this. This is, this is why I've taken this kind of tangent through ancient Greek philosophy. Diogenes was essentially converging with an insight of Deleuze and Spinoza, which is that one's own joy, the experience of qualitative differences in one's own capacities, that that is the truest signpost or guide. That is the North Star for, for what one should be optimizing for. And and that, in other words, one should trust the signals of one's own body, one's own emotions, one's affects, and specifically that crucial, specific, irreducible difference, which we talked about in the previous lecture. The difference in the feeling of one's own of one's own capacities. You can feel intuitively. You have we have intuitions or immediate automatic kind of subconscious emotional bodily responses to any situation in which our capacity to act increases. When that happens, and this is straight out of Spinoza, the emotion that is associated with that is called joy. It's a, dis it's a very specific feeling, and you know it when you have it. You don't have to prove it to anyone. It's not an argument to be made. It's, it's, it's a qualitative, irreducible difference, and it is essentially the increase of power within oneself, within one's capacities to act. Remember, we're not talking about power over, the French term for that is pouvoir. We're talking about power to. The term for that is puissance. These are very different types of power. Okay, and so what Diogenes gave us a kind of extraordinary example of was what it might look like to conduct a kind of political praxis that is, I would argue, following on from the philosophies of someone like Spinoza and then Deleuze. So there's an obvious kind of weird historical looping here because obviously Spinoza and, De and Deleuze came uh, long after Diogenes. Diogenes, this is in ancient Greece. But the narrative that I would put forward to you is that it was in ancient Greece, <clears throat> kind of the initial rise of modern Western societies as we know it, at the founding of modern Western bourgeois culture, it makes sense that that's when kind of the the practical insights of how to conduct a kind of militant, liberating, kind of radical praxis would first emerge, right? But it doesn't emerge where people think it emerged. It's not Marx. It's not, you know, the the major explicitly political projects of of Western history. It happens at the very beginning in this very obscure way that people still don't understand in the form of this particular philosopher named Diogenes and, and these strange, bizarre, uh, cynical or cynical operations.
And then what happens is, I would argue, this gets essentially sublimated into Christianity, really. In some sense, Jesus Christ was a successor of Diogenes. The common concept to them both is this concept of presia. Um, you can find I, I, I did a talk recently on this concept of presia. If you're interested in what that means and want to know a little bit more about that, you can you can search for that podcast that I did. It's, it's available online. And this concept of presia is essentially radical free speech, but specifically a kind of radical free speech that gets you in trouble. By getting you in trouble, it shows that you're being serious. It, sh it forces people to trust you. And it is, in fact, a credible signal. And What's really interesting about this is to bring it full circle to another thing we've we've talked about. And when I first introduced the information theory stuff, you might have wondered, where is this going? How, how is this all going to add up? Well, guess what? Parisia, or radical free speech, as Foucault describes it in his final series of lectures in The Courage of Truth, it's the title of the book, Parisia is a costly signal. Okay, so the reason why Diogenes' operations worked the reason that they actually did have impacts on society, the reason they actually did change the way people think, and and the reason why Diogenes was arguably the second most powerful person in ancient Greece, second only to Alexander the Great, there is a hard empirical political and economic logic to why Diogenes' operations had reliable and predictable political effects. And that hard scientific logic for why that works is only discovered a very long time after in the discovery of the the nature of information because that is all about signaling right so this this game theory for instance which gives us the vocabulary of of signaling games and understanding how signaling works like when a message actually gets communicated to other people and when it doesn't the the conditions under which a message will successfully be understood by another op population and when it will actually have an effect on that receiving population. That's all formalized in game theory. Game theory is downstream of information theory. It's downstream of those uh, momentous discoveries that were achieved during the war effort, okay? So it's only in the past couple decades that we have developed a formal scientific empirical logic for how communication really works and the conditions under which it does work and when it doesn't work. That was, on we only had the fortune of that kind of scientific formalization we've only as a, we've only as a species achieved that in the past few decades but diogenes knew it intuitively and then much later spinoza started to formalize it a little bit with with a little bit more sophistication then deleuze essentially tries to develop a whole metaphysics around it okay and it's only after that that we start to see the actual empirical implications. And the empirical implications are essentially the rise of, of, of digital society. And so what I'm arguing here is that when you, when you connect all of these dots, you really do start to see a radical politics emerge, a kind of coherent formulation of political praxis that is concrete, that's not this flowery, difficult, confusing thing that no one can really make heads or tails of. It's not this kind. It's not like a Marxist system where it's this uh, really dense, convoluted three-volume book you have to kind of understand, and then maybe you can figure out how to kind of create class consciousness through a dictatorship of the proletariat and all these kind of like kind of insane, ridiculous, difficult kind of uh, mental and practical obfuscations uh, that always end up requiring some kind of like authoritarian structure to to impose. It's it's none of that. It's a relatively, I think, coherent, concrete, and specific political logic for how to produce collective liberation as individuals and also as groups. Um, if you connect all the dots between Deleuze, Spinoza, Diogenes in ancient Greece, and information theory, essentially, then you get a compelling and coherent praxis for how to conduct genuine liberating radical politics without relapsing into any of the kind of horror shows of the 20th century that essentially followed the kind of Marxist line. Okay. So all I've done so far is I've kind of painted, you know, these puzzle pieces. I haven't really given you the, the philosophy as such yet, but now I think we're in a position to do that. So I'm just going to take a sip of water. And if this has seemed quite diffuse and all over the place and a bit confusing, I will now take a moment 
to relax my my brain and my vocal cords, and I will bring some for you. I've been going for quite some time now, by the way. So just gonna take a breather. <clears throat> All right. So to wrap this baby up, let us circle back briefly to some of the seeds that I planted in the first part of the lecture. Specifically, if you recall, when I was going through Deleuze's distinctions between control societies and disciplinary societies, I said that here would be a particularly promising place to, to look. Because here, Deleuze is saying that he thinks what is characteristic of control societies is that they have a vulnerability when it comes to jamming, piracy, and viruses. Okay, so what does he mean by jamming, piracy, and viruses? Well, I would argue that we can condense these three ideas into essentially a concept that was put forward in the first case by Diogenes. So Diogenes was known for this concept of defacing the currency. That is how his operations and his performances were described. And I think that's about as close as we can get to a specific, concise, theoretical condensation of the entire kind of political logic or praxis that I'm sketching for you today. It's all about defacing the currency. So if you want to change the world, if you want to change society, if you want to increase the amount of political liberation. In other words, if you want to foment political revolution and overturn all that is false and rotten in society, um, the way to do that, there is a specific and tried and true way to do that. And it is called defacing the currency. Diogenes provides kind of the initial body of work that gives us examples for what this looks like and how, and, and how it actually functions. Foucault's book, The Courage of Truth, spells it out in a little bit more detail. He talks about how the ancient cynic who does these kind of crazed philosophical performances, that what they're doing is they're testifying to the existence of an other life, another kind of life, but specifically by essentially speaking truth in a way that is excessive, in a way that is punished, you create a signal that cannot be denied. And I mean this in a formal way. I mean this in a technical way um, within kind of the theory of the, the mathematical theory of, it, of communication. By speaking the truth in a performative way that gets you into trouble, that signal gets through to the population. It can't be denied. It can't be ignored. It can't be unheard or dismissed. Okay? That's signaling theory. It's a costly signal. If you are speaking the truth in a way that gets you in trouble, that is essentially – all Diogenes meant by defacing the currency. Now, why did he call it defacing the currency? Here is, here is why. Here, here's what that means. When you speak the truth in public in a way that gets you in trouble, what you're doing is you're changing how people value things, right? Because if I say some kind of provocative truth and I get in trouble, but I'm still living, I'm still happy, and by all measures, I'm even more happy, I'm even more content, I'm living a better life afterwards. That is a performative operation that proves that my values are better than the values of the reigning bourgeois hypocrisy. You're, it's essentially the transvaluation of values, to use a Nietzschean phrasing. Defacing the currency means to literally change how other people value things in a way that they can't ignore. This is not a rational debate, right? They... You don't have to make anyone agree with you. By speaking the truth in a way that gets you into trouble, you're not appealing to rationality. You're not asking people to debate you. You're not trying to convince them or persuade them. You are 
changing the nature of reality, essentially, by sending a signal that is, in fact, credible. And it is credible because it is costly to the speaker. Okay? That is the basic logic. And I believe that that is essentially what Deleuze has in mind when he's talking here in the postscript about jamming piracy and viruses. As he says, these are the major vulnerabilities of contemporary digital control structures that define modern information societies. And what that means, though, the way that I would have you interpret that, jamming piracy and viruses, don't think about the kind of technical, computerized versions of those things, which they're most likely to kind of trigger in your mind. But think about it as cultural activity, cultural cultural activities that jam the already existing codes, cultural activities that hijack the meaning of particular codes, piracy, stealing the meaning of contemporary codes, or creating contagions, creating it, putting out into the public behaviors that are seductive and attractive that other people want to emulate and will emulate. This type of jamming, piracy, or viruses that control structures today in modern information societies are vulnerable to, I am telling you that there is a very specific way to exploit those vulnerabilities of jamming piracy and viruses. And that specific, concrete, reproducible way is what Diogenes called defacing the currency. And Foucault explains it in great detail in his in his book, The Courage of Truth. It has a few defacing the currency is a pretty specific operation and it has just a few key kind of criteria but the main way to summarize it you can go into more detail if you want and maybe i'll do other lectures on this in more detail but the basic logic of defacing the currency is that you speak and perform truths that the current kind of unjust order of lies and oppression is not willing to confront you find the foundational hypocrisies that are at the core of all kind of bourgeois, modern, public, rational, social interchange. You find hypocrisies or false falsehoods that are so foundational that when you speak them and when you perform them, not just speak them rationally, but actually embody them in a way that causes you punishment, that makes people hate you or makes people dislike you or whatever the case might be, Some it just has to be some form of public, visible measurable suffering or pain or punishment or cost that you experience as the speaker or performer of that kind of foundational hypocrisy, the person who's calling it out and is getting punished for it. Whenever you do that, you create a signal that cannot be ignored, it cannot be unheard, and that actually changes the values that dominate in society. That's what that, that's that's what the concept of defacing the currency means. You're taking the currency, like what people currently think is valuable, and you're shitting on it. You're, you're, you're changing its value. You're decreasing the value of that which is currently valued because you believe it's false and wrong. And you are increasing the valuation of this other kind of life and other life. And in doing so, you actually are imminently creating the possibility for this other kind of life. Other people will see it. They will, they will increase their valuation of it. They will find it interesting or attractive, and they will start to do it themselves. Not because they're not because you're a fashion setter, but because you're actually doing something that's more true. It's actually liberating. It's actually better. And to get that on the agenda, to have that political effect, it is a defining requirement that you have to take your licks. You have to take on some punishment. And this is why the theory of information is so important, because that is what shows on a formal level why why this is the case. And it has to do with the nature of signaling. A signal – on a formal level, a signal is not uh, compelling or credible. People don't have a reason to believe it unless the speaker incurs some kind of cost. And that's what makes the signal stick out through the noise, okay? And that's a formal – that's a formal idea that is theoretically, mathematically, and empirically demonstrable. Of course, we only got that much later, but all of these kind of geniuses from Diogenes to Spinoza to Deleuze, they're all zeroing in on that – on that basic – phenomenon or process, but they're doing it in an, in an intuitive way, in a philosophical way, in a metaphysical way. Okay. Uh, I just think that the, the nature of the information revolution and the discoveries that were made in the middle of the 20th century, both theoretically and practically what's happened. And this is essentially why now we talk about accelerationism. This is essentially how we enter into the accelerationist 
kind of moment philosophically and politically is because the formalization of information theory and the discoveries, theoretical, but also innovations, technical, that it gave rise to have sort of solidified beyond any objection or doubt the intuitions that people like Diogenes and Spinoza and Deleuze were building over time. And now it's just beyond undeniable. These are real processes that are underway and that are now more and more explicit. And so what to give you kind of the best possible example to make all of this super concrete, if you're still wondering where the hell I'm going with all this and this kind of crazy diffuse connecting of dots between Foucault and Deleuze and Diogenes and Spinoza and the mathematical theory of communication, Claude Shannon, it really becomes crystal clear when you look at cancel culture today. It's so, it's sort of the, the perfect kind of exemplary illustration of everything that I'm talking about because what you're seeing today with people like me in my own career, but also many other people, is that in the current order, there are many hypocrisies that are so foundational, you're really not allowed to talk about them. And if you talk about them, you get in trouble. But what we're now learning is that if you talk about these foundational hypocrisies in public and you get in trouble, well, guess what? The predictions of Diogenes are now more clearly demonstrable than ever. Because what happens is when you get in trouble or when you get canceled, it validates the trustworthiness of your message, essentially. It doesn't mean everyone's going to like it. That's going to be kind of fragmented and conditional on a variety of different kind of uh, psychological and attitudinal and sociological variables that condition that. But when you get in trouble for calling out certain things that you're not allowed to call out, what is now very obvious is that you gain followers you gain, you get attention. People look at you and they think, I can at least trust this person. They might be wrong, but I can at least trust them because they're willing to get in trouble for what they think. And that gives them a kind of power that organizes bodies and minds around the person who is canceled. And then essentially you're able to build a new world around that. You're essentially able to fork reality as such. You're, you're forking the social code base and around you will emerge um, this new opportunity to basically um, con conduct this kind of uh, forking of of what people currently believe. And that's the, the transvaluation of values. That's essentially political praxis. That is the construction of community and and all of those things become possibilities in the wake of a kind of parisiastic performance of any kind that gets sufficient kind of gravity, okay? Um, that is what I think Deleuze meant by jamming piracy and viruses. That is what I think Diogenes meant by defacing the currency. It is essentially the concept of presia. It is essentially radical free speech that causes the speaker some sort of punishment. That produces real political power with concrete, demonstrable, and inescapable uh, political, like real political implications, meaning the actual distributions of powers change in those moments. And I think it's even provable in some sense if you take what I'm saying as consistent with the kind of mathematical theories of information and signaling. Okay, so what? And I and I believe I, I believe that 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 is the case. So that is what a Deleuzian radical praxis looks like in the information age: a radical politics fit for control societies rather than Foucauldian disciplinary societies is essentially one of. performative operations of speaking truths radically in a way that is excessive, in a way that scrambles the codes, in other words, of, of institutional societies. And I mean, look, I could give you a whole other hour worth of lecturing about how this works in practice, for instance, in my own personal case, like how I was a professional academic for five years. And I was, you know, I was, I was deeply enmeshed and successfully so in the, in, in society, in society's kind of, uh, institutions of the control society. And like, I mean, I could seriously write a whole book just about kind of how this works in detail and breaking down like one case study and using myself as an example. I'm going to pause here because I don't want to make this, uh, you know, closing section all about me or anything like that. It's, it's not about me. It's about a much more general kind of process that I'm describing here. And so I think I've pretty much summarized my vision of a Deleuzean praxis, a revolutionary political praxis that follows on what I think is the most sophisticated and empirically correct 
diagnosis of where we are as a society sociologically, but also I think that this kind of Deleuzian praxis, as I'm as I'm sketching it out from Diogenes to Deleuze, is pretty much the only way to reliably foment collective liberation in a way that doesn't re-territorialize, to use a Deleuzian term, on all of the kind of authoritarian horrors of the 20th century, as we've seen in kind of top-down Marxist attempts to, you know, take over the state or institute the dictatorship of the proletariat. I think this Deleuzian method, I think there's a deep coherence to it. I think it's scientifically and empirically accurate and, and validated, essentially. And I think it reliably works to create new forms of power, to foment collective liberation, to literally increase the power to or the puissance of other people and yourself in a reproducible way. The, the primary mechanism or the primary operation is to simply speak truth in a way that is excessive, to perform the truth in a way that is excessive, that bourgeois hypocrites don't like and will punish you for. And in that punishment, you are validated. Your ideas are essentially proven and tested. Your credibility is established beyond kind of rational uh, deliberation or dispute. And with that, a kind of collective political energy or resource is uh, produced out of thin air almost in this kind of magical operation that it, well, it's not magic. It, it was magic until we had the kind of mathematical formalization of information theory and communication theory. To Diogenes, it, in Diogenes' age, it, you know, it was a kind of magic, right? Because we didn't have the science to back it up, but now we do. Uh, and it, Diogenes called it defacing the currency. And I call it, well, I don't, I don't even have a name for it. <laughs> I, I, I think that's uh I'm, I think I'm totally my brain is totally fried now I went for almost an hour and more than coming up on two hours so I'm fried I hope that was interesting to you I hope that was useful if you have any thoughts or comments please do feel free to leave a reply but just so you know I'm going to be taking this down and this will be put into my online course my video lecture series on Deleuze this is the fourth in a series um, I will be doing another one tomorrow and one at the day after that. Okay. So uh, if you found this interesting, come back tomorrow. I'll be talking uh, about tomorrow. I'll be talking about post Delusian strands. I will talk about tomorrow. I'm going to talk about uh, Giorgio Agamben in particular and a kind of radical group called Tikkun, which I've always been a fan of. They are essentially, I think, some of the best and most interesting people working in a kind of post delusian line of inquiry and experimentation. So I'm going to explore them and teach you a little bit about them. And then on Friday, I'm going to talk about Elizabeth Grosh, who is a feminist, kind of an academic, kind of a normal academic feminist, but she's interested in Deleuze and she's also uniquely interested in, in Darwin uh, and, and evolution. So uh, we're going to look into her work uh, because I've been looking for an opportunity to explore it and this gave me a good reason to do so. So I'm going to hopefully sketch out the parameters of a kind of based and red-pilled Deleuzian feminism. 